This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by readingwithyourkids.com slash dreams. Readingwithyourkids.com slash dreams. Hey, have you ever dreamed of uh, having more time with your family? Having greater financial security, sharing your passion for books and literacy, maybe building an amazing home library. What about traveling the world or helping others reach their dreams? You know, thousands have discovered life-changing opportunities with us-born books and more. It's more than just a career. These people find a close network of friends who encourage them to reach for their dreams, and they cheer one another on when they achieve them. Now, whether you're looking for a career with a potential six-figure income or you're just looking to add a few hundred dollars a month to your family with just a few hours of work each week, Us Born Books and More has an exciting opportunity for you to make a difference in the lives of children all around the world. There's a world of possibilities awaiting you. Please visit readingwithyourkids.com slash dreams. Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast, an iTunes number one kids and family podcast. STEM Week continues. STEM Week continues. Our great guest today is Heather Montgomery. She is the author of two delightful books that really are going to engage kids in the, in, in the love of science and the love of being curious. Her name is Heather Montgomery, and she is the author of Bugs Don't Hug and Something Rotten, A Fresh Look at Roadkill. Joining us on the line somewhere between Tennessee and Alabama, kind of like a twilight zone. It's quite appropriate for this topic. She's the author of some great books. We're going to start talking about her brand new book, Bugs Don't Hug. Please welcome to the show, Heather Montgomery. Heather, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you today? I am wonderful. When we were having a little chat earlier about how much we love um, Tennessee and about my experiences in Alabama, and I actually love Alabama too. We had a good time down there, and um, and and I really love Heather's brand new book. It's just out. It's called Bugs Don't Hug, and it's a perfect book for your. Um, well, I think lots lots of kids would love it, but I think it's a perfect book for your first, second, third graders. Would you agree? I would. It's one of those books that speaks to a lot of people because, you know what, it's about family, and we never think about insects and families. That Mm -hmm. just doesn't come across as normal. But believe it or not, many bugs do actually parent or care for their kids. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I was, as I was reading through your book, I was really fascinated. I mean, I think, I think, it, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if it was the first example, but, um, you know, you start off very early in the book about how, um, bugs don't eat scrambled eggs for breakfast or bugs' moms don't cook them scrambled eggs. And then you go, and then you said, well, but wait a minute, there are these bugs. And why don't you pick it up from there? Yeah. So, for example, you don't think of bugs as doing diaper duty, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Well, in fact, some do. There is uh, an ambrosia beetle. The mom and the dad both take care of the kids, and the kids live in a little tunnel, a side tunnel, kind of like a bedroom. In fact, they call it a cradle. And when they're mm, when when they're they have to go to the bathroom, mm-hmm. you know, it, they kick it out into the main tunnel. And dad's job, dad's job is to clean the house, and he has to kick it all the way out and kick it right out of the end of the log. What so. Is- not what you think of. Yeah. What a good dad. I'm proud of that. That's what I used to do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't kick it out. I would have if I could. <laughs> Dads do amazing things in this book. Yeah. And so do moms and brothers and sisters, too. Yeah. And, and you're right. We don't think of uh, a lot, of, especially with bugs, we don't think of family. You know, we, we you kind of get, get the Disney family with birds and bears and things like that. But, you know, I really, you know, bugs, how do they, you know, they're just there. They're all, they're just there. And we don't think of family and how they're raised and how they live together. Right. And one of the big things that really struck me here is that insects are so different from us physically Mm -hmm. that we assume they're different from us in their needs. Mm -hmm. Yet. We're all alike in so many ways. And that's a bigger message that I wanted to get across. Sure, the book's about insects and how 
you know, they're so different and so surprising, but there's so much going on in the world where we can connect to people. We can relate to other people, other organisms, just by some common things like, look, we need to feed our young, right? Mm -hmm. Our kids need food. Our kids need shelter. And, you know, there's also all the crazy stuff like the bugs that make spit soup for their kids. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. And one of the things that, that really kind of struck me, um, and it's, it's subtle and it didn't, it didn't occur to me in, initially, but then as I was reading through the book a couple of times, and, and that's one of the, to me, that's a testament to, you know, how good a book is. Like, if you read it once and you're entertained, great. But if you go back and you're reading it a couple of times, then there's, there's definitely something there. And one of the things that really kind of struck me is that you, you, you've set the book up with these kind of, you know, bugs don't cook scrambled eggs for their, for their kids. But, and so you, you kind of set up bugs don't do this, but they do do this. Um, and, the illustrations kind of go with that. You know, the, the initial illustration about the bugs don't cook scrambled eggs for their for breakfast, that's kind of a really kind of a fun kind of cartoony kind of illustration. But then when you turn the page and then you learn the real deal, the, those illustrations are much more lifelike. Yeah, Stephen Stone did an amazing job. And uh, Charles Bridge, the publishing house, did a fantastic uh, job of, of seeing this vision I had because, uh-huh. you know, science is fun. Yes. And so many times we are so careful with our accuracy in science that we forget the fun of it. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I love to do when I work with kids is play with it, you know, play with the fun. And this idea that, you know, no, they don't make do scrambled eggs, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't do diaper duty. They don't play peekaboo. But wait, there are these things that are so similar to us. So let's look at that. I like to play with fiction versus nonfiction. Mm-hmm. And I like to look at that balance. And it's fabulous to use a book like this with kids and, and ask them questions like what's real and what's not real. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll take this into a classroom and we'll look at the illustrations. And they can pick things out really quickly, but it helps in – learning to evaluate mm. what's on in the book, you yeah. know, both from the illustrations and from the text. Mm-hmm. What's different there? And and what are the clues that tell me, wait, wait, this is a fact, and wait, this is something that's just for fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I like that a lot. Yeah, and that's a great, great lesson. I was just speaking to another guest about this, especially – Especially now, and I'm not just talking about this, you know, because because we're always hearing this this term fake news, but because there's so much information available to kids, and they're growing up in this, in, they're, they're, there's a tsunami of information that are coming at kids, but not all of that information is accurate, and a lot of the information is created to be funny, but the people creating it aren't skillful enough to be able to say, this isn't real. We're, we're having fun with this. And so it's presented as real. And a lot of people look at it and it's like, Oh, this is, this is happening. But meanwhile, the people created that information. No, no, that's, that's satire. That's, we're trying to have some fun with it. And you kind of didn't get it. And so I, this is a great thing that for parents to do, to talk to their kids about evaluating where they're getting their information from. Well, and the really cool thing is that myself, as a as an author, I mean, I write nonfiction, but guess what? I realized as I was reading uh, an advanced copy of this book to a group of second graders, it's actually an opinion. Uh-huh. I mean, the whole book is based on an opinion that I am presenting this idea that bugs, in fact, are like us. Mm-hmm. And so it helped me realize that everything that we state, it's it's our own bias, mm. right? And helping helping a person to think through what their biases are, are so valuable. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And listening to other people and realizing that everything that we hear, um, even if it's a factual information, it's coming from um, an opinionated person because mm-hmm. we are human and mm-hmm. we should be. You know, that's that's just a part of who we are. So I think it's really cool to kind of dive into that in this way that's like silly and crazy and you know has all this your bug stuff, fun facts are my thing. Yeah. But fun facts that really help you go, wait, maybe I should think about that just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, why 
are bugs like us and why aren't they like us? And, you know, what's, what is, what is there there mm-hmm. that I can really dig into? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's really fascinating that, that whole idea, um, of, of helping our kids become media literate, helping them understand that everything, every piece of media that we, consume that we experience was created for somebody and that person had a purpose when they were creating it maybe it was just a very benign purpose uh or maybe they're trying to sell you something get you to think about a certain thing uh but they come at it with with a purpose and they come at it with their own bias i'm curious where did your bias this kind of love and connection with bugs come from well, I've been asking myself that a lot because <laughs> it wasn't always that way. In fact, you ask my brothers or my dad, they'll tell you that I was petrified of spiders. Now, a spider's not an insect, mm-hmm. but I don't remember my reaction to other bugs when I was a child. But I know I was so scared of spiders that, well, here's the story. <laughs> I, I really wanted to go to church camp forever, uh-huh. and I finally got to go. But they had pit toilets, uh, and you know what was in the pit toilets. Uh, <laughs> and those latrines were spiders. I made myself sick uh, because I refused to go to the bathroom. Uh, um, and that's how scared I was of them. But I remember my mother, she would take me over. She didn't love spiders either, but she would take me over to the window. We had this glass door out to the deck. She'd take me over the window and say, look. And she pointed a spider web glistening in the sun. Uh-huh. You know, and then I remember her giving that spider a name and day after day, you know, I remember this through the years like this would happen and she was helping me Mm -hmm. on that step. Mm -hmm. And so I dedicated this book to my mother because, you know, that's what it takes. No matter what it is, a child is fearful. It takes little steps, Mm -hmm. right, of someone who loves them to take their hand and go with them. And kind of when I wrote this book, I was thinking in the opposite direction. A lot of times it's adults who are fearful of insects Mm. and kids love them, right? So I wanted to help adults see that they're okay too, Mm -hmm. you know? Their child brings them those really cool grasshopper and, you know, not everybody's excited about that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's that idea of, of how do we overcome the things that are fearful? And for me, it was a loving parent who helped me, but also it was knowledge. Like, I got to college and I loved animals, so I took entomology, the study of insects. Mm. Well, I wasn't really wild about it, but that professor was amazing. Mm. You know, that professor showed me things. And then later, when I became a camp counselor in college and the girls in my cabin were afraid of bugs, guess what? I had to be the one who helped them through that process. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of growth that now, like, yeah, my, my room is full of insects. Um, I love bugs. They're, they're fascinating. And part of it's because they're small and I can approach them. Uh-huh. They're wildlife that I can see every single day and learn something new from. And that just blows my mind, you know. Yeah. And, and one of the things we were talking about is that Alabama is this place that has such biodiversity. And so there are billions and billions of bugs and creepy crawly things that, that maybe, you know, living right outside your your door. There are. Every morning when I take my dog for a walk, we discover something. And, right, Alabama has biodiversity like you would never expect. Mm -hmm. We're called America's Amazon, in fact, because of it. It's just amazing. So there are tons of things here, but there are things everywhere. I'll go to a school and talk to kids, and I'll get letters from them, and they'll say, Miss Heather, Miss Heather, do you know what I found on our playground? And it's because they just stopped and started looking. And that's the thing. There's amazement everywhere. It could be on your front porch, you know? Yeah. And that is such a valuable lesson for uh, for us to share with our kids. But even more importantly, and, and I really mean this, for our kids to help us reconnect with. Just that there are so many things in our world, so many things that we don't even see. We pass by them, we step on them, step over them, and we're not aware of all this life, all this beauty that is surrounding us. Right, because we 
we have to turn some things off mm-hmm. to get where we're going, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we as adults have, have learned to stop that. But kids aren't afraid to ask those questions. You know, they stop and they look, I love it. I, I used to run an environmental center, and I would hike kids down the same trail. And I'd hike the same trail a thousand times. But every single time, a child would point out something that I had missed. Wow. And that was awesome. So cool. So cool. Particularly the time they pointed out the snake that I had just stepped over. Oh. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And the snake just sat there. He wasn't interested in me, but the kids were like, Miss Heather, a snake. It was great. That's amazing. (laughs) We, my, my wife and I, we, we live, um, you, you were talking about living on the, on the state line between Alabama and Tennessee. And uh, we, my, my wife and I moved from the inner city where we kind of grew up. And we live, we still live in Boston, but we're right on that city line. And on, on the other side of our property is a wildlife sanctuary. So 20 years ago when we moved out here to the country, quote unquote, uh, it was a new experience for us, and now suddenly we have 26 trees in our backyard and all these these bugs and whatnot. And one day, I remember, we came home, and it was kind of late at night, and uh, we got out of our van, and we heard this noise. And we walked over, and the, the sidewalk in front of our house was covered with about 100 frogs. I have no idea where they came from. They were there, and they've never come back. But that, and we always look, did that really happen? And of course, yep. we were terrified. We yep. ran inside. You know, they they were probably mating. They were oh, probably okay. migrating uh-huh. because they need to find a water source. Mm-hmm. And so we don't think, I mean, we think of large creatures as migrating. We right. think about the elephants migrating. We think about mastodons migrating we think about birds migrating but we forget so many other animals migrate for one reason or another Mm -hmm. and for amphibians it's almost always adults need to find the water for to have their family you know yeah wow and 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 speaking of migrating while my wife and i were down in panama we saw one of those those classic um ant trails where you know just a, a bazillion ants are walking marching in line carrying different leaves and twigs and things like that and we're like i we're in a national geographic documentary all of us <laughs> right in front of us this is all happening this is awesome i'm jealous i want to see that that's oh, pretty cool it's very very yeah. cool well speaking of cool now now hug, bugs don't hug is just released now you also have talk about uh, uh coincidence i I don't know of many authors who have uh, a book, one book released in September, one book released in October, but you have another book coming out in October, in just a few weeks, called Something Rotten, A Fresh Look at Roadkill. I know, right? Roadkill. <laughs> well, since we're talking about migration, that fits right in here because frogs, I experienced uh-huh. a huge, a huge frog, toad, actually, roadkill one night Mm. um we don't think about it but animals do need to move Mm. and one of the places they move is across roads Mm -hmm. so it's really tragic to see that to witness um that but something kind of crazy happened to me one day when i i looked at some roadkill um it was a snake it was a rattlesnake that had had gotten hit and i happened to be writing a book about rattlesnakes at that point in time and i didn't um i didn't really have the answer to a question. It was when a rattlesnake goes to shut its mouth, how come it doesn't bite itself with those mm-hmm. long fangs? Mm-hmm. And I had read an answer um, in a book, but it didn't quite make sense. So I was out for a jog and happened to see this dead rattlesnake. And I did something you shouldn't do. Uh-huh. But now I'm a trained biologist, so I do know how to handle snakes. Mm-hmm. However, even a dead rattlesnake can envenomate you. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't resist it. And I picked up the rattlesnake. And, um, oh, my goodness, I learned so much from that rattlesnake today. It became my teacher. I mean, that day, Mm -hmm. um, I spent the entire day learning from that snake. Phenomenal things. And by the end of that, I I asked myself, wait, if I learned this much from one animal that lost its life, are other scientists doing this? And that was the start of this book. Mm -hmm. I didn't know then. Um, But that question... Of, of there's an animal who's who's lost a life and it's tragic, but can we not make something good from that? Mm-hmm. I know 
gonna just blew my mind what scientists are discovering mm-hmm. from dead bodies. Yeah, so. yeah, it's 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 incredible. And um, and now this book is aimed at an a, a older, older audience, uh, would you? much older. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, but again, it's that I, th- I think it's that that kind of of um, play between the gross kind of fun stuff that that guys especially and a lot of young ladies would be into the roadkill and the guts and the goo and all that kind of stuff and then juxtaposing that with with the facts and and the things we can learn from taking a look at that muck right and and the whole book is really a piece of my struggle to deal with that juxtaposition Mm -hmm. because my heart hurt every time I saw an animal, mm-hmm. but my mind was so fascinated by the animal. I mean, it was kind of selfish, but when I saw a bobcat that had gotten hit, I was going to have an opportunity to touch a bobcat. What? To touch a bobcat? Like, who gets to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I found that the scientists were taking this crazy, ridiculous material. I mean... Who gets a dead animal shipped to them in the mail? But scientists do. Uh-huh. In fact, they they are discovering so many amazing things. They're helping to prevent roadkill as well. But, for example, a scientist discovered contagious cancer thanks to roadkill bodies, right? Contagious cancer, I didn't even know there was such a thing. We really yeah. didn't even understand it. And now she's probably the premier scientist. She started an entire lab to understand the maybe three types of cancer on the planet that we know of that are contagious. Um, and all because when she was a grad student and couldn't find specimens because it's hard to get specimens of endangered species, there was a roadkill animal and she stopped and looked at it. Wow. And there was this big lump on its snout on this uh-huh. Tasmanian devil. And she said, why, how, what is going on here? So that's the kind of discoveries that people are making. Um, from roadkill. And, of course, there's all kinds of crazy, ridiculous stuff, too, like the fact that in New York, um, they turn their deer roadkill into compost, which is phenomenal. Like, why were we ever putting those bodies in a landfill that mm-hmm. took up space? No, that they they turn it into into compost. They add wood chips. And, in fact, they the product that comes out, the soil that comes out, is cleaner than the wood chips that went in. Wow. Because yeah, right? Because of the process of decomposition, it heats it up and it kills the bacteria. So then the New York Department of Transportation has fabulous soil for all of their road projects. It's just brilliant. That you know? is brilliant. Yeah, that is brilliant. And those are the kinds of things that I discovered. And that's that's the thing that was so fun about this book is it's my journey to like figure this out. Mm-hmm. And what I discovered was like <laughs> blew my mind. Yeah. 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 And, and I one of the things I loved and, and I had a, a one of one of the jobs that I had when I was much, much younger before I started doing magic. I was working in a school for kids with severe develop, developmental disabilities. And I had never worked with that population in my life. And these were kids who were 14, 15, 16, and they were functioning on a 12 month old level they're that 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 challenge um and and so i was working with all these experts and people had gone to school for years and years and years and they knew all about what the kids couldn't do and i didn't i i didn't have any of that knowledge so when i would work with the kids i would just go why don't we try this and the experts would scoff me, oh no they can't do that wait wait a minute they're doing that what in the and the discoveries that we made, because this silly, simple, not educated person <laughs> said, "Why can't we?" And I think that's kind of this, one of the things that you're you're talking about is these people are just coming across, and they have some knowledge, but it's wh- what can we do with this? Wh- wh- let's look at this, and and even if kids aren't going to grow up to be biologists, this is a great way to start getting them to be curious and to ask questions and to give them empowerment, give them license to ask questions. And I think that's incredibly important. Yeah, it is so powerful. So the questions drive my life. I mean, inquiry has taken over. Like, I can't stop it. And it's so amazing what you discover. The thing is, something like roadkill, 
we drive down the road and we see it and we turn away from it because yeah. it's gross <laughs> and it's sad. But wait, what if we did the opposite? What if we turned towards it? What if we asked those questions? You know, why why that opossum get hit right here? Mm-hmm. And wait, I saw an opossum hit here six months ago. Why is that? Mm. And guess what? the amazing thing is when we start asking those questions and when people start paying attention, they notice that there are certain hot spots, mm. certain places along the roads. And right now people can take their app, their phones, and they can document this is a really amazing thing to do. They can document where they see certain species hit. And wow. scientists can use that. It's just amazing. California has this amazing system where there's a group of volunteers that are doing this. And when the road engineers are now designing roads, they're using the data from the citizens, from people, you know, clicking pictures out of their cars. They're using that to design bridges right over roads. Whoa. Because guess what? If that's the one place where all the animals are getting hit, why don't we put a bridge for the animals? And they use it. Mm-hmm. And they save thousands of animals' lives. But the thing we forget is they're also saving thousands of human lives. Absolutely. So, yep. Right? Yep. It's phenomenal. And when you look at a culvert and you say, wait, an animal could go through the culvert instead of up and over the road, but they'll only do it if they don't have to get their feet wet. So why don't we design culverts a little bit wider? So that the water just goes through the center, and on the edge, there's a path. And guess what? They do it. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. A group of kids in South, uh, South America said, well, well, why don't we help the monkeys get across the road? The monkeys don't want to climb to the bottom and cross the road. No, they want to stay in the trees. So why don't we string some ropes across? And guess what they did? Yes, Jeez. kids did that. Jeez. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah, they got with the power companies. And they design this whole system, and the kids go out, and they check it on a regular basis. It's just phenomenal what you can do when you start asking these questions. Wow. Powerful stuff. Absolutely powerful stuff. Well, we have to check. uh, We want folks to check these books out. But first, I I need to know, because I need to go there myself. Uh, Is there a website where folks can connect with Heather Montgomery and find out about what is fascinating you now? Yeah, heatherlmontgomery.com. Okay. And uh, I live in the state of Alabama, and what's the capital of Alabama? Montgomery. Montgomery. So That's just remember the name. There you go. There yeah. you go. All That's right. Great. Well, we want you to check out the books, Bugs Don't Hug. It's available now, and something rotten, a fresh look at Roadkill will be coming out in just a few weeks. Heather Montgomery, I know, I know for a fact that I'm going to be inviting you back to the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. I had a great time. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. STEM Week continues talking about one of my favorite subjects in the world, elephants. Patricia Newman is going to be here talking about her brand new book, Eavesdropping on Elephants. We hope you are loving STEM Week, and we would love to get your feedback. There's so many ways you can send us feedback. Of course, you can go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the contact button, let us know what you think about STEM Week, gives us some recommendations, some suggestions for future shows. You can also connect with us on Facebook, facebook.com slash readingwithyourkids. Find us on Twitter, at Magic and on Instagram, at magicjedley. Hey, we want to thank Heather Montgomery for being here today and letting us know that bugs don't hug. Well, actually, I guess they do. And we also want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to read with your kids. We'll be looking for you in the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.